The Story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting Chapter 12 Medicine and Magic Very, very quietly, making sure that no one should see her, Polynesia then slipped out at the back of the tree and flew across to the prison. She found Gub-Gub poking his nose through the bars of the window, trying to sniff the cooking smells that came from the palace kitchen. She told the pig to bring the doctor to the window, because she wanted to speak to him, so Gub-Gub went and woke the doctor, who was taking a nap. Listen, whispered the parrot, when John Doolittle's face appeared. Prince Bumpo is coming here tonight to see you, and you've got to find some way to turn that boy into a grown-up. Be sure to make him promise you first that he will open the prison door and find a ship for you to cross the sea in. This is all very well, said the doctor, but it isn't so easy to turn a boy into a grown man. You speak as though he were a cheese to be aged. It's not so simple. Shall the leopard change his spots or the Ethiopian his age, you know? I don't know anything about that, said Polynesia impatiently. But you must turn this boy older. Think of a way. Think hard. You've got plenty of medicines left in the bag. He'll do anything for you if you change his appearance. It is your only chance to get out of prison. Well, I suppose it might be possible, said the doctor. Let me see. And he went over to his medicine bag, murmuring something about gray dye as a temporary measure spread thick. Well, that night Prince Bumpo came secretly to the doctor in prison and said to him, White man, I am an unhappy prince. Years ago I went in search of the sleeping beauty, whom I had read of in a book. After having traveled through the world many days, I at last found her and kissed the lady very gently to awaken her, as the book said I should. Tis true indeed that she awoke, but when she saw my face she cried out, Oh, he's but a boy child, and she ran away and wouldn't marry me, but went to sleep again somewhere else. So I came back, full of sadness, to my father's kingdom. Now I hear that you are a wonderful magician and have many powerful potions, so I come to you for help. If you will make me older so that I may go back to the Sleeping Beauty, I will give you half my kingdom and anything besides you asked. Prince Bumpo, said the doctor, looking thoughtfully at the bottles in his medicine bag. Supposing you just waited a few years until you actually become older, would that not do instead to make you happy? No, said Bumpo. I've waited long enough. I must become a full-grown man now. You know, it is very hard to change the age of a prince, said the doctor. One of the hardest things a magician can do. I have some gray dye. Would dyeing your hair gray like that of an older man's do? Yes, that should suffice, said Bumpo because I shall wear shining armor and gauntlets of steel, like the other grown-up princes, and ride on a horse. Must your hair be gray all over? Yes, all over, said Bumpo. And I would like to be taller and have more muscles, too, but I suppose that would be very hard to do. Yes, it would, said the doctor quickly. Well, I will do what I can for you. You will have to be very patient, though. You know, with some medicines you can never be very sure. I might have to try two or three times. You have thick hair, yes? Well, that's all right. Now, come over here by the light. Oh, but before I do anything, you must first go down to the beach and get a ship ready, with food in it, to take me across the sea. Do not speak a word of this to anyone, and when I have done as you ask, you must let me and all my animals out of prison. Promise? By the crown of Jolly Jinky? So the prince promised and went away to get a ship ready at the seashore. When he came back and said that it was done, the doctor asked Dab Dab to bring a basin. Then he mixed a lot of medicines and dyes in the basin and told Bumpo to dip his hair in it. The prince leaned down and put his hair in, right up to the ears. He held his hair in there a long time, so long that the doctor seemed to get dreadfully anxious and fidgety, standing first on one leg and then on the other, looking at all of the bottles he had used for the mixture and reading the labels on them again and again. A strong smell filled the prison, like the smell of burning hair. At last, 
the prince lifted his hair up out of the basin, breathing very hard, and all the animals cried out in surprise. For much of the prince's hair had turned gray, and the hair at his temples was snow white. When John Doolittle lent him a little looking glass to see himself in, he sang for joy and began dancing around the prison, but the doctor asked him not to make so much noise about it, and when he had closed his medicine bag in a hurry, he told him to open the prison door. Bumpo begged that he might keep the looking glass, as it was the only one in the kingdom of Jolly Jinky, and he wanted to look at himself all day long, but the doctor said he needed it to shave with. Then the prince, taking a bunch of copper keys from his pocket, undid the great double locks, and the doctor, with all his animals, ran as fast as they could down to the seashore, while Bumpo leaned against the wall of the empty dungeon, smiling after them happily, the hair at his temples shining like polished ivory in the light of the moon. When they came to the beach, they saw Polynesia and Chi-Chi waiting for them on the rocks near the ship. "'I feel sorry about Bumpo,' said the doctor. "'I am afraid that medicine I used will never last. Most likely his hair will be as black as ever when he gives it a good wash. That's one reason why I didn't like to leave the mirror with him. But then again, his hair might stay gray until it grows back in. I had never used that mixture before, to tell the truth. I was surprised myself that it worked so well. But I had to do something, didn't I? I couldn't possibly scrub the king's kitchen for the rest of my life. It was such a large kitchen. I could see it from the prison window. Well, well, poor Bumpo. Oh, of course he will know you were just joking with him, said the parrot. They had no business to lock us up, said Dab Dab, waggling her tail angrily. We never did them any harm. Serve him right if his hair does turn black again. I hope it's a dark black. But he didn't have anything to do with it, said the doctor. It was the king, his father, who had us locked up. It wasn't Bumpo's fault. I wonder if I ought to go back and apologize. Oh, well, I'll send him some candy when I get back to Puddleby. And who knows? His hair may stay gray and white after all. The Sleeping Beauty would never have him, even if his hair stays gray, said Dab-Dab. He looked better the way he was, I thought, but he'd never be anything but ugly, no matter what color his hair was made. Still, he had a good heart, said the doctor. Romantic, of course, but a good heart. After all, handsome is as handsome does. I don't believe that poor booby found the Sleeping Beauty at all, said Chip the dog. Most likely he kissed some farmer's fat wife who was taking a snooze under an apple tree. Can't blame her for getting scared. I wonder who he'll go and kiss this time. Silly business. Then the push me pull you, the white mouse, Gub Gub, Dab Dab, Jip and the owl Choo Choo went on to the ship with the doctor. But Chi Chi, Polynesia, and the crocodile stayed behind because Africa was their proper home, the land where they were born. And when the doctor stood upon the boat, he looked over the side across the water, and then he remembered that they had no one with them to guide them back to Puddleby. The wide, wide sea looked terribly big and lonesome in the moonlight, and he began to wonder if they would lose their way when they passed out of sight of land. But even while he was wondering, they heard a strange whispering noise, high in the air, coming through the night. All of the animals stopped saying goodbye and listened. The noise grew louder and bigger. It seemed to be coming nearer to them, a sound like autumn wind blowing through the leaves of a poplar tree or a great, great rain beating down upon a roof. And Jip, with his noise pointing and his tail quite straight, said, Birds! Millions of them! Flying fast! That's it! And then they all looked up, and there, streaming across the face of the moon, like a huge swarm of tiny ants, they could see thousands and thousands of little birds. Soon the whole sky seemed full of them, and still more kept coming, more and more. There were so many that for a little they covered the whole moon so it could not shine, and the sea grew dark and black, like when a storm cloud passes over the sun. And presently all these birds came down close, skimming over the water and the land, and the night sky was left clear above, and the moon shone as before. Still, never a call nor a cry nor a song they made. 
no sound but this great rustling of feathers which grew greater now than ever when they began to settle on the sands along the ropes of the ship anywhere and everywhere except the trees the doctor could see that they had blue wings and white breasts and very short feathered legs as soon as they had all found a place to sit suddenly there was no noise left anywhere all was quiet all was still and in the silent moonlight john dolittle spoke i had no idea that we had been in africa so long it will be nearly summer when we get home for these are the swallows going back swallows i thank you for waiting for us it is very thoughtful of you now we need not be afraid that we will lose our way upon the sea pull up the anchor and set the sail when the ship moved out upon the water those who stayed behind chichi polynesia and the crocodile grew terribly sad for never in their lives had they known any one they liked so well as dr john dolittle of puddleby on the marsh and after they had called good-bye to him again and again and again they still stood there upon the rocks crying bitterly and waving till the ship was out of sight <laughs>